Uh, first of all, when we're talking about objectivity, objectivity is something that where multiple uh, people can observe something and then they can they can come to the same conclusion. Uh, that is at the very sort of it's it's at the very heart of science, right? Uh, that's something that we can agree on. Uh, this is obviously the, what you're talking about when you're talking about personal experience. I mean, this is a kind of experience that you have. I'm not saying it's not legitimate. It's legitimate. That's how you feel, uh, but it's not objective. So th that's one thing that I think we 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 all agree on. Uh, the second thing is. Yeah, so the second thing to Armin's point is that uh, these personal experiences that people feel, uh, they are, they're not just limited to religion. Um, and you go different, they actually vary geographically. I, I think one of you, Tahir, you're a psychiatrist? Uh, Omer is. Omer, right. Omer is a psychiatrist. So, so when, when, uh, when I did my psychiatry rotations in, in medical school, I remember I did my medical school in Pakistan. So in Pakistan, uh, there were several Imam Mehdi's. Uh, in every psychiatry ward, several of them, <laughs> and then no, I, I'm, I'm I'm being completely serious. And in addition to him, while they were there within the ward, because they used to congregate together, there were always a couple of them that were there, sepistalar, which means I think uh, a chief, uh, the army chief, or, or something like that. So, and they they genuinely believed it. These experiences were yeah. real. Uh, if you know, I mean, you know about schizophrenia. When people have these delusions, these delusions actually they feel very real. Uh, and even the definition of delusion, the very definition of delusion, has a disclaimer in it. It says a, a fixed, fixed belief. Yeah, well, it's what a fixed with false one belief. Met another uh, Mahdi. Yeah, I know. Uh, hold, yeah, I know. We'll get to that in a bit, maybe. Okay. Oh, but okay. let me just say, it says uh, it's a fixed false belief, uh, but <laughs> there is also a disclaimer, and in in many definitions of it, that says that this is not. It, this excludes religious and cultural beliefs, because they're so widespread. I, which is very telling. It shows that there's so much similarity between their, they're so sort of phenotypically or on the surface, they, they're so similar that uh, you actually need this, this disclaimer to, to separate the two. So this is the problem with uh, using it, especially in a conversation like this, where you know that, you know, we obviously come from a different place than you in terms of the way that we think uh, to use that as a, as a form of, uh, evidence in a way. I, I I don't think you can use personal experience or who you feel is talking to you and who but you're you in communication okay, with. Okay, to be fair to them, they didn't. They, yeah. they, no, they, I, okay, they fair, yes. No, no, let me let me let me let me clarify. To be yeah. fair to them, they said that they never said that their personal experience. He actually said that that his personal experience is not meant to convince us. He said that his personal experience has convinced him. Yeah, yeah, convince so him at an individual level. So, as you said, yeah. that with uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, when he said that, you know, you as long as the individual hears it, then it goes on. Uh, the, but but there is there is a problem of objectivity. So the question is again going back to has science made religion uh, uh, has science made religion obsolete? Um, one thing I'll say is I think that they can coexist. They clearly do coexist. Science and religion coexist. There's a lot of things that science has not been able to answer. Um, and the one thing, and I'm going to quote Penn Jillett here, that uh, science did, the scientific revolution did, that no other revolution did before it, is it said the three words, I don't know. That's it. Um, uh, nobody in the past, no political system, no other power system, no religion, nobody in the past had said, I don't know. They'd always tried to give answers, right, yeah. uh, without actually having evidence. Science just said, if you have an idea, even philosophy Some Hindu gods, didn't do that. Say they don't. Yeah, but they, what they would do is they would say that, you know, if you have an idea, no matter how beautiful it is, right, you put it up against nature and see if it jives. And if, you, if it gives you evidence, then you have something to work with. If it doesn't work with nature, no matter how amazing the idea is, no matter how strongly you feel it, no matter how individually you're connecting with where the idea is coming from, you know, if it doesn't work with nature, then the answer is not that it's not true. The answer is just that we don't know. And, and, and that's, that's really it. That, that is our position. People often think that atheists think, oh, there is definitely no God, the same way that religious people say there's a God. But most atheists, what they say is they don't believe in God, but that doesn't mean that they know for sure that there is no God. That's why most okay. atheists are actually agnostic atheists. But, yeah. okay, let's, 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 so there's, there's a lot in that. So I might kind of go back to some of the things you said earlier. So I think Armin sure. hit the, the nail on the head that we never said that on an objective level for assessment, you should use personal experiences. In fact, the whole idea of the prophets of God, the reason why they come is so that they can be the benchmark by which you assess others. 
they can be the ones uh, whose you know prophecies that you can assess and see whether there's evidence enough for me as an individual to say actually there's something really in that you know i think i think this person may well have been true i think he was true and actually i'm now going to undergo the path which he laid out for me so that i myself can have the same enjoy some of the same spiritual fruits that he had so that's the whole thing it's these things are gateways for individuals to undergo these uh, spiritual practices. So, I mean, we're talking about what the prophets had. So let's talk about, for instance, um, I'll talk, I'll give two examples, probably only one of which you'll, you'll be familiar with. There's one thing, for instance, which is the uh, World War One prophecy of uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Guardian. So we believe, uh, and it's very well documented in our literature and in our books, that in 1905, uh, the Promised Messiah is what we call him, so I'll refer to him as that. The Promised Messiah uh, wrote a poem which was published uh, in 1908, which very clearly talked about a worldwide calamity which would completely destroy the existing social and political order in which the Tsar would be overturned and disgraced. And the Tsar at the time in 1905 and in 1908 was the most powerful man alive. And this was, of course, fulfilled in 1915 to 1918. And at the beginning of that war, the caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community said, this is that event which people currently think is just a European war, will become a global war, which will uh, fulfill that prophecy, and the Tsar will be um, destroyed in this war. And we have those magazines. And in 1917, he was. So in uh, a magazine called The Review of Religions, uh, there was a fantastic article a few years back, which goes through that prophecy, um, which people can uh, assess. Now, in fairness, you've probably never heard of that. So I don't at all, I'm not expecting you to jump on the train and say, well, that's it, that must be true, okay? <laughs> We're just giving that as an example because this is something which in the 20th century has occurred, which everyone has a shared social memory of, which we believe was uh, clearly prophesied. And he said that this would be the sign of my truth. The great, you know, or basically yeah. said this is so, the greatest so, sign of my truth. So, and so, he died in 1908. So, so prophets are there to demonstrate that objective evidence so that you can then pursue that path that they lay out for you. 